Now, if you would open your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 11. And then there are just a couple places that I would have you mark in your Bibles this morning um, so that when we get to it in the, in the message that it's, it's readily available and you don't have to turn to it so much. So there's three places that I would have you mark if you could. They're up on the screen, Ezekiel 36. Romans 8 and Matthew 6. I want to give you just a moment just to go ahead and mark your Bibles. If you have a ribbon, just mark it with a ribbon. If you have a piece of paper, just kind of slip a piece of paper in there and give you just a moment. And we'll pray for the message real quick. Father, thank you, Lord, for <clears throat> this opportunity, again, to share. Lord, I know that there are people here, well, we all are here, Lord, to hear from you. Lord, your word tells us that today, if we hear your voice, not to harden our hearts. And I ask, Lord, that you would help us uh, to hear your voice, to hear what your spirit is saying to the churches, and, Lord, to humble ourselves and to receive what it is that you have to say And Lord, to apply it to our lives, to bear fruit and to grow, Lord, ever closer to you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so let me ask you, have you ever watched someone do something that is so beautiful that you think to yourself, man, I wish I could do that? Now, I remember so long ago when we were first building out this building, uh, Bill Norris, the gentleman that uh, helped lay all the tile, was laying the tile in that front foyer, and I've never seen it done before. I know, I'm a sheltered person. Never seen it done before, and he was laying that tile, and it was amazing. I've never seen anyone just, he was quick and fast, and it just started covering up the ugly cement, and it was just turning into this beautiful walkway. And I was just standing there staring at the the whole process, and I said, Bill, I'm sorry, I hope you don't mind that I'm watching you right now, but... um, I've never seen this before. And so he said, no problem. And, and it was just a wonderful thing. Maybe for you, it was, it was watching someone play an instrument or watching someone paint or, or whatever it is. Listen, this is what's taking place in our passage of scripture today. Here we're taken into, I believe, uh, the inner circle to see a very precious moment, an intimate moment, uh, I would say, where the disciples are watching Jesus pray. And they think there's, there's something about it that's so amazing. There's something about it that's so beautiful that when the Lord is done, they just ask him, can you teach us how to do that? Now, to the title of today's message is the disciples' prayer life. Now, if you have surrendered your life to the Lord Jesus, you are his disciple. And one of the most precious gifts a disciple is given is prayer. The lines of communication have been opened by the shed blood of the Lord Jesus to our Heavenly Father. And one of the first things that the Lord teaches us about genuine prayer is that each person must desire it for themselves. Look at verse 1. It says, Now it came to pass, as he was praying in a certain place, that when he ceased, so in other words, they're watching him, and they just let him go until he's finished, That one of his disciples said to him, Lord, can you teach us to do that? Can you teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples? Now, pause for a moment. Notice the Lord's method here, how the Lord teaches uh, his disciples to pray. Notice what he doesn't do. He doesn't say, okay, fellas, listen, next week we're going to gather together and I'm going to teach every single one of you how to pray. No, he doesn't do that. Instead, what the Lord does is he lives a beautiful life of prayer among them. And as they watched him, again, as we've noted already, they noticed how beautiful it was, how helpful it was, how important it was, how real it was. And then the Lord just waited. He waited until they asked. He waited until the desire built up inside of them. And then they asked. And I believe the Lord did it this way on purpose. You want to know why? Because you cannot force a person to pray. 
Listen, as much as you might want to, as much as you might wish that your husband or your wife would pray with you more, as much as you might wish that your, your spouse would pray with your children more, you, there's just no way that you can force that to happen. So listen, learn from the Lord's example here. Just live a beautiful life of prayer among your family. Live it among them and know and know that the Lord is faithful. He will stir them as they watch you. And now it may not be according to your time, but God is faithful and he will stir their hearts. The beauty of prayer is to the child of God as a cool breeze is on a spring day. And being here in Colorado again, it's wonderful. Let me tell you right now, where I'm from in Charleston, it's already 100 degrees. And there's humidity involved with it. Our poor kids, when they went back, they just started melting the moment they got off the plane. But, you know, as a glorious sun rises to the morning sky, you cannot force prayer upon a child of God. You can only show them the beauty of it. So first, Jesus lives a a prayer life among them. And then when their hearts are stirred, then and only then, he begins to instruct them. So look at verse 2. Now I'm going to break this up, obviously. This is a well-known prayer uh, known as the Our Father. And I'm just going to break it up into sections Uh, to kind of hopefully make it maybe um, a little more applicable for us. So it says in verse 2, So he, Jesus, said to them, When you pray, say, Our Father in heaven. So when the disciples watched Jesus, again, it was was different from anything that they they had ever seen before, anyone that they had ever heard before, probably even different from anything that they, they themselves have ever prayed before. And so when they ask Jesus to teach them to pray, Jesus instructs them in a, in a revolutionary way and subsequently instructs us by Jesus telling his disciples to call God their father. He is telling them something different. And that is that the basis of prayer is a relationship. And he is instructing them, instructing them to pray, listen now, from their heart from their heart. With the use of the word Father, he is showing us that prayer is more than just reciting a set form of words. Because you see, there is a way to approach God as one would approach a human dignitary, if you will, that they have no relationship with. And that's by, you know, uh, citing a formal creed or citing a, a, a a formal doxology. And this was really the method of prayer used by the Jews and the pagans alike. And this is why Jesus would say in Matthew 6, verse 7, Listen, when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Prayer, everyone, is not a matter of many words. It's not a matter of oratory skills. Have you ever listened to someone, you've been in a prayer circle, and you've listened to someone just kind of go on and they start using, you know, these voice inflections and these words and you're thinking, man, I can't do that. Well, listen, that's, that's not what happened here. Jesus was praying in such a way, the Son of God was praying in such a way that it had the opposite reaction to the disciples. They went, wow, I think I can do that. Would you teach me how to do that? Prayer is not a matter of oratory skills. It is the language of the heart. It is the language of the spirit to a loving God. And so again, Jesus would instruct us to pray, saying, listen, but when you pray, go into your room. And when you shut your door, pray to your father. Isn't it interesting? The world is now so um, obsessed with coming out of the closet. And Jesus is saying, I want you to go in your prayer closet. And I want you to pray. It's interesting because, I, you know, I agree with Jim Simbola. You know, the world is, is um, concerned about, and the Christian world, if you will, is concerned about getting prayer in schools. But what about getting prayer back into the church? The church needs to learn how to pray long before the world needs to learn how to pray. He says, go into your room, shut your door, pray to your father who is in the secret place, and your father who is sees in secret will reward you openly. Here again, Jesus directs our hearts to approach God as our Father. So again, prayer is rooted in relationship. The relationship is that of a parent to a child, a father to a son, a father to 
his daughter. And so that makes me uh, ask the question, so what's required in order to pray? What is required in order to pray? Listen, you don't need to know everything there is to know about the Bible in order to pray. You want to know what's required to pray? Humility. Humility is what's required to pray. For the adult man or the adult woman who have become so hardened in life to approach God and, and call him Father, it requires humility. And if one cannot humble themselves and approach God as their Father, they're not going to get very far. So prayer should be from the heart. Jesus gives us the right, the incredible right to call God our Father and teaches us to do so. The next thing that he teaches us to do in prayer is to pray with reverence for the name of God. Look at verse two again. He says, hallowed be your name. In other words, say this, hallowed be your name. Holy, Lord God, is your name. Now, many of you are familiar with what is known as the Tetragrammaton. The Tetragrammaton is the Greek word meaning four letters. And it refers to the four letters found in the Hebrew text for the name of God. Now in the English, those letters, those consonants are Y-H-V-H. In Latin, those letters are Y-H-W-H. There are no vowels in um, the language there. Years later, vowels would be added to the Tetragrammaton to spell the name Yahweh, as you might see it up on the screen. Now, Jewish scholars consider the name so holy uh, that they don't even read the four-letter word when they come upon it in the text, when they happen upon the name of God. They don't even try to pronounce his name. The most common name that they use today in Israel to refer to God is Hashem. Hashem. So if you hear you know, them speaking, you'll hear them say, well, Hashem gave us a beautiful sunrise this morning. And, um, and that's what they use. Let me ask you, is there a person in your life that when you hear their name, it causes some sort of reaction in you? I think that never, for every single one of us, there is a person that if you were to say, or if I was to say their name, it would cause some sort of a reaction. It wouldn't not necessarily be a big reaction, but just some sort of reaction. Now, I'm going to perform a little test. I have some names I want to read off to you. And as you hear them, now you just, I'm not looking for a big reaction. I'm just kind of thinking you might think in your mind, you're going to go, hmm, or Oh, or, ooh. Okay, are you ready? Donald Trump. See, there's just a little bit of reaction there. Bill Gates. Steve Jobs. Howard Schultz. Barack Obama. <laughs> Benjamin Netanyahu. Kim Jong-un. Michael Jordan, Joe Montana, Tom Brady. You know where I'm from in Charleston? Yeah, we would get a big boo on that one. It was amazing. <laughs> Taylor Swift, Paul McCartney. You, you get what I'm saying? Names have the, just, just the name. Maybe it's your father. Maybe it's someone in your family. How about the name of Jesus? The Bible says that Jesus' name is the name above all names, and it is to be regarded by his children as a holy name. Warren Wiersbe tells the story of uh, President Lyndon Johnson's press secretary, Bill Moyers, how he was praying before lunch one afternoon, and he was praying so quietly that the, the president couldn't hear him, and so he said, speak up, Bill, I can't hear a thing. And Moyers quietly responded, I wasn't addressing you, Mr. President. <laughs> Listen, there is a name that is above every name, even the president's name. It is important for every disciple to know that God cares about his name and the reputation of his name. It's an odd thing, isn't it, how the children, his children, can tarnish his name I think we understand this, right? When your child gets into trouble, what's your first concern? Your first concern is, don't you understand how that reflects on me, right? But when your child does something amazing, then what do you do? Oh, yes, well, this is my child. Yes, this is uh, my son. This is my daughter. They're, they're wonderful. And, and that's just kind of how we respond. 
And so the child of God can do the same thing to the name or reputation of God himself. If you have Ezekiel 36, Mark, turn to Ezekiel 36. And we're going to pick up in verse 16. The Spirit says to the prophet, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, when the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they defiled it by their own ways and deeds. To me, their way was like the uncleanness of a woman in her customary impurity. Therefore, I poured out my fury on them for the blood they had shed on the land and for the idols with which they had defiled it. So I scattered them among the nations and they were dispersed throughout the countries. I judged them according to their ways and their deeds. And when they came to the nations, wherever they went, they profaned my holy name. When they said of them, well, these are the people of the Lord, and yet they have gone out of his land. But I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations wherever they went. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, I do, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the nations wherever you went. You understand, our behavior reflects on the name of God. Now, Ezekiel was a contemporary of Jeremiah. He was a contemporary of, of Daniel, right? He was taken in, in, the, um, in the captivity to Babylon when the, when the second kingdom fell to Babylon. And so he saw firsthand how everyone was behaving, how everyone was living before they were taken captive, and then he saw what was going on even after they were taken captive. Verse 23, he says, And I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst, and the nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when I am hollowed in you before their eyes. So in other words, when the body of Christ reveres and respects the name of God with all of their heart, with all of their soul, and with all of their strength, it gives God glory. And it makes the unbelieving world stand in awe that, wow, we must really, he must really be a mighty God. He must really be a holy God that is worth us being careful of how we live, of what we say, of what we do. God cares about his reputation. When God's name is treated with contempt by his children, we cause the world to speak evil of God. And listen, that's a great evil. That's a horrible sin. So Jesus teaches us to pray from the heart he teaches us to pray with reverence for God's name. And next, he teaches us to pray about the future. Look again at verse 2. He says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Get this now. The future that we are instructed to pray for is God's future for all of creation. The beautiful thing about praying for God's will for the future, and this is a wonderful thing that the Lord has done for us. And instructing you and I to pray for God's future for the world is it does an incredible thing. And that, that is it should take the worry out of our hands. It should take the burden off of you. Why? Because the outcome does not rely upon you. It doesn't rely upon me, nor does the burden. It doesn't belong to you. It doesn't belong to me. And the Lord makes it clear to us that he does not want us to worry. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But I do want to take a moment and I want to challenge you. I want to lay something on your heart and I want you to take this to heart. This might come as a shock to many of us. But listen now, the only way disciples of the Lord Jesus are to pray for their personal future is in so much as it fits in with God's plans for the future. Disciples of Jesus do not live independently from God's will. You may think that you do, and you may try to. And if that's the course that you're on, listen, I, want to just, I just want to warn you, you're, you're headed for a crisis. You're headed for a crisis of faith. Remember, these are the terms for what the, the, the new buzzword is for being a Christ follower, right? If you turn back a, a page or two, look at Luke chapter 9, verse 23. The Lord Jesus says, 
If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his Father's name and of the Holy angels. And if we are living independently from God's will, listen, you're in for a big surprise, especially as his child. You see, we no longer have the rights to our own lives as his children. We belong to God for his purposes, right? This is what the the Spirit says to the apostle in 2 Corinthians 5. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him, for them, who, who, for him who died for them and rose again. Sorry. So, so the, the thing that you do when you, when you read that is you think about, you do an inventory. Think about your life. Think about where you are. Are you living independently from God's will? You have to ask yourself that question. Examine your heart. Examine your life. First Peter chapter 4, verses 1 through 2. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same mind. And I love that phrase. You want to know why? That's a military term. Arm yourself. Why? Because you are in constantly being attacked by the enemy to do what? To, to live separately. It's a constant barrage of your life to be interested in what the world is doing. To live for yourself. So you have to think in a military sense of arming yourselves with the same mindset that since Christ died for me, I'm going to die for him. Since Christ lived for me, I'm going to live for him. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Verse 2, 1 Peter 4. That he no longer should live the rest of his time, the rest of your time on earth, in the flesh, for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. So if you believe that your prayers are not being answered? Ask yourself. If you believe your prayers are not being answered, you may very well be correct. They may not be being answered. And it may be because you are living, you are pursuing, you are planning your future. Listen, do I dare say, as if God doesn't matter. You're planning your future as if you don't belong to God. Now, quick note here. If we are to pray for God's future, for all of creation, then it should stand to reason that we should know God's plans for the future. Do you know God's plans for the future? Let me ask you, when is the Lord going to return? When is that going to happen? When is Jesus coming for the church? Is it separate from his return to the earth? When is the Antichrist coming? What has to happen in order for the Antichrist to return? Does God still have plans for the nation of Israel? Is that even important? Israel's future is being played out right before our very eyes every day. Does that matter to you? Does that matter? Does that have an impact on your children? Does it have an impact on your grandchildren? I want to tell you, does it have an impact on the people that you work with? I guarantee you that the people that you work with need to know God's plans for the future. And so as the Lord instructs us to pray for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, it is for us to know as much as we can possibly know what that is so that we can help our children, we can help our grandchildren, we can help the people that we work with understand what God is doing, that we can get on the Lord's page and not ask God to always be getting on our page. So what's it going to take in order to do that? Study. Read. Study. Study. The Spirit says to the Apostle, to show yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, but one who rightly divides the word of truth. So a disciple should pray from the heart to the Father. The disciple should pray with reverence for the name of God. The disciple should pray for God's future. And the disciple should pray for your daily needs. Look at verse 3. The Lord says, say this. In other words, pray along these lines. Give us day by day our daily bread. 
Jesus wants every single one of us to know and to understand, profoundly know that God, listen, God cares for your daily needs. He really does. God cares for them. And he instructs us not to worry about our daily needs. So if you have Matthew chapter 6, Mark, turn to Matthew 6. We're not going to read all of this section, but just a good reminder to get it in your mind and in your head. We're going to pick up in verse 30 in Matthew chapter 6. The Lord says, Now if God so clothes the grains of the field which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What am I going to eat? Or what am I going to drink? Or what am I going to wear? For after all these things the unbelievers seek, your heavenly Father knows that you need all of these things. But here's what you do. Seek first my kingdom the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of those things will be taken care of for you. They'll be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. When Jesus says to pray, give us day by day our daily bread, this of course conjures up God feeding the the nation of Israel miraculously in the desert with manna. And to remember how God did. He miraculously provided for them. So disciples should pray for the day's needs and not worry about tomorrow. The next thing the disciples should pray is not to have any outstanding issues with people. Any unforgiveness that you're holding towards other people. So the Lord Jesus says in verse 4, say this, pray along these lines, forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. Listen, a servant is not above his master, right? That's correct. Jesus is not asking us to do something that he himself has not done. He hung on a cross and he prayed, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. One Bible commentator said this, As bread is the first need of the body, so forgiveness is for the soul. Pastor Chuck Smith says that forgiveness towards others is the sign of true conversion. It is the sign of true conversion and that it's important for your mental health. And I would add it's important for your spiritual health. Disciples should be operating from a clean slate. I mean, honestly, we really don't have the right to hate anybody. What the Lord has forgiven us, the tremendous amount of sin that he has forgiven us, I don't have the right to hate anyone, but to love them. So the Spirit said through the apostle in Romans 12, if it is possible, as much depends on you, live peaceably with all men. So lastly, all Christ followers, disciples should pray for the leading of the Holy Spirit. So this is, this is the Lord instructing you. This is your prayer life. These things are the things that should be helping you as you pray to, to enrich your prayer life, to ignite your prayer life, that it may be alive and that it may be active. And the last thing is that you pray, you ask God on a daily basis, listen, maybe on a morning, afternoon, evening, minute by minute basis, Lord, would you please lead me with your Holy Spirit? He says, Say this, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now, I know it sounds like Jesus is implying that God leads us into temptation, but but nothing could be further from the truth. The idea is, if God is truly the one who is leading us in everything in all of our lives, then it would be consistent to pray, to always pray, that we are never in a place of temptation. And it is also for us to know that it is never God who would ever lead us into temptation. The Spirit confirms this through the Apostle James when he inspires him to write, Let no one say when he is tempted that I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed, then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. So along these same lines, we're going to conclude with uh, reading in Romans chapter 8. If you have Romans 8 marked, uh, look at Romans 8, and we're going to pick up in verse 
12, again, the Spirit says to the apostle, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Some of you just need to underline that. You just need to underline that. If you live according to the flesh, it is just this simple, you will die. And listen, you don't even necessarily have to step outside of your house in order for that to be true. You can live in the flesh in the safety of your own four walls. You can watch things you're not supposed to be watching. You can click on things you're not supposed to be clicking on. You can saturate your mind with fleshly things. The Bible says, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Remember what you're praying. You're praying, Lord, I don't want to be led into any of these things. He says, but if the Spirit, if if you're led by the Spirit, this is how you know. You ever wonder, are you being led by God? This is how you know. You'll put to death those things. You won't even give them an opportunity. You'll put them to death because you know it's not good for you. You know it's not what the Lord wants you to do. You'll put to death the deeds of the flesh. You will live, he says. Verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again uh, to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out what? Here we are right back to the very beginning. What does the Lord say to do? Call him father. That he is your daddy. Verse 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Now, one of the just kind of a side note things about this verse that I absolutely love is that this is the verse that the Moravian believer spoke to John Wesley on the boat. John Wesley left England and he went to Georgia to convert the Indians and he was an Episcopalian priest, but he was not saved. And he went and he failed miserably in Georgia. And as he's on the boat and he's going back because he got himself into trouble and he's heading back, he happens to to be on a boat with a whole bunch of Moravian believers who were on fire for the Lord Jesus. And he was just like, what do they have that I don't have? And this is the question that the Moravian believer asked him. He said, does the spirit bear witness with your spirit that you're a child of God? And John Wesley was like, well, yeah. (laughs) But it wasn't. And it wasn't until he got back to England that the Lord used that verse to haunt him. And he surrendered his life. And shortly after the great awakening happened, verse 17, and if children, then heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Suffer that you suffer with him. Yes. Is it hard on you not to watch certain things? Then count it suffering. Is it hard on you not to read certain things, not to click on certain things? Then count it suffering. Is it hard on us to receive, you know, ridicule and mocking from people that we work with? Then count it suffering. If we are worthy to be counted, uh, you know, suffering with the Lord Jesus, then may we also be glorified with him. This is what he is saying. So the disciple should pray that he is led by the Holy Spirit. They're watching Jesus. They're in this intimate moment, this inner circle, something about the way that the Lord is praying. And they're going, Lord, would you teach us how to do that? And the Lord is saying, pray from your heart. Pray with reverence to God's name. Pray for God's future. Pray for your daily needs. Pray from a clean slate and pray to be led by God. 